Generation Seminar Series, and we have uh, Mr. Robert Wilton today with us uh, from the ICO, International Civilian Office, um, in Kosovo. Um, so Mr. Wilton is going to talk to us about um, intervention in uh, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, in, in the specifics. Um, and he's going to talk about the themes um, throughout um, the history of intervention uh, in uh, Southeastern Europe. Uh, Europe, and he's going to, uh, um, of course, tell us about Kosovo, which is where he, uh, he works in at this um, moment. Um, Mr. Wilton is currently the head of policy and political affairs at the ICO. Um, he's also been private secretary to the Secretary of State, um, worked for the Ministry of Defence. Um, he's also um, professor of uh, international relations um, at the University of uh, um, at the Amer American University in Kosovo. And that means something slightly different to what it means here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and he was also professor of history at the American University in Kosovo. He was also advisor to the Prime Minister of Kosovo from 2006 to 2008. Um, he's also a writer. Um, um, on um, Southeastern Europe. He's just finished um, his first um, historical fiction um, book. And he also translates poetry from Albanian to, um, to English. He's um, also the co-founder of a charity that works in Kosovo. And the charity name is the Ideas Partnership. And the charity um, deals with issues such as education and cultural heritage. Uh, so with that further ado, I'll just uh, leave you to it. Thanks, so thanks very much. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's always um, slightly scary and uh, very stimulating to have to uh, or to be asked to come and talk something like this. Uh, and it uh, kind of pulls me between uh, an academic side of things and the practitioner side of things. Uh, I'm going to talk today, um, as Lisa has said, uh, a bit on um, kind of the history of the region, interventions in the region, and also uh, on my own current experience uh, intervening state building in Kosovo and then uh, when I get bored or you get bored and start throwing things we can start and have a conversation uh, and I'm very happy for that to go uh, any way you like. Um, I should say at the start that I'm talking completely uh, on a personal basis um, which means that I can say what I think uh, rather than what I ought to think as a British government official or an ICO official or anything else. So. Uh, when uh, I had this kind of I had this kind of daydream that one day the uh, political and security uh, committee uh, of uh, the European Union uh, will <coughs> invite me in uh, as their kind of special guest, and they'll say to me, uh, Robert, um, you were right all along. We were wrong. Uh, tell us, tell us, you know, where we've gone wrong, and tell us how we can put the world to rights. This is the kind of daydream I have in the frustrations of Kosovo, and when that finally happens, when that daydream comes true. Uh, I will tell uh, these, these great men and women of the European Union about uh, Jerj Fischler and the Hall of the Ages. And that was the reason uh, for, for, for the title of the talk. Uh, and I will tell you today uh, what I think about uh, the Hall of the Ages uh, and why the Hall of the Ages uh, is important for those of us who continue to try to interfere uh, in Southeastern Europe. Uh, and this has given you my background. Uh, I am, uh, by origin, a British government civil servant um, because that was less interesting than, no, it's precisely as interesting as you would think it is. Um, that led me to end up uh, increasingly working on southeastern Europe and eventually um, to be working in Kosovo, first as an advisor to the Kosovo government and now uh, working with an international ad hoc organisation, the International Civilian Office. Uh, so what you're going to get is a bit of um, me, Historia, and also probably a bit more of me, um, intervener, state builder, frustrated and wanting to uh, get off his chest, his prejudices um, and the things he thinks about. I'll jump around a bit with some of the, the kind of the references and the comparisons to other interventions, uh, particularly in southeastern Europe. Um, I should stress that the only one I can really claim credibly to talk about with any significant uh, practical basis is Kosovo. I'm not going to focus too much on military interventions particularly. Um, arguably, uh, all of the military interventions that we now see are kind of um, boutique uh, interventions. Um, they're not interventions of necessity. Um, they happen 
uh, only when the, the military challenge is, uh, is doable and knowable. And they argue it only happen because the military challenge is doable and knowable. They're, they're interventions of choice in that sense. Uh, I think there's an interesting debate we could have about whether a, uh, whether a preemptive intervention in Iran, which everyone's now talking about for later in the year, would be an intervention of necessity. It's a, perhaps a, a separate conversation we can have. I would argue, though, that um, the business of establishing um, a, a military presence in places like um, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Libya, that basic business of supplanting one military reality with a different one, our own one, has tended to be the relatively easy bit. And I say that with a, a strong emphasis on the, the relatively, because clearly it's been painful for other people. Um, it's the follow-up, though, that I think has always been harder when we are on the ground, um, when we're trying to function there. Uh, perhaps the, um, the, uh, the only comment I'll make on, on the, the military interventions at this stage, and I think though it is important for what um, I'll, I'll come on to say later, is that one of the things which Kosovo taught us amongst other interventions is that air power alone does not do it. Uh, it's part of it, but it does not do uh, the, the whole trick. Um, <coughs> air power is, air intervention is, is relatively simple <coughs> and clear cut in its uh, assumptions, uh, in its rules, in its effects, in its risks. Um, but at best, it, um, it, it worsens uh, a state of chaos or a vacuum of authority. Uh, we presumably intervene because we want a different authority, um, and that means influence on the ground in the end, one way or another. In Libya, we were the, uh, the kind of the air force and the international lawyers for the Libyan opposition. Uh, in Kosovo in 1999, uh, one of the factors that uh, pushed Milosevic to concede was when uh, a prolonged uh, air campaign of uncertain success was transformed by the real threat of a ground intervention. Uh, and to me, the, the substantial tests of uh, the intervention in Kosovo have been on the ground. Perhaps that intervention means stabilisation. Perhaps it means uh, state building. We can look at it in different ways, we can call it different things, we can find different motives for it. Uh, almost invariably it means trying to shape the, the reality on the ground to suit our ends, our interests as interveners. Uh, again, that's I think an important idea and we'll come back to it. Because uh, I am a sort of uh, an historian monke, uh, but I had to go and get a proper job, um, I tend to think of these things in historical terms, uh, and uh, I think of 2012 as the uh, 100th anniversary, not just of 1912, but more particularly of the, uh, the independence of Albania. Uh, and that's the, that's the reason for the title, uh, originally 100 years of not learning from international interventions in the Balkans. Uh, 1912, uh, Albania at uh, first kind of declares its independence uh, from uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, and it's then the country of Albania is carved up at the Treaty of London, I think, by uh, the great powers in, in traditional great power form. Uh, and we see uh, the first of the century's uh, international interventions in southeastern Europe. Uh, and to me, it's a, it's a kind of uh, bizarre Ruritanian story, which is worth a read because it's so bizarre, but also because I think it offers us uh, some uh, lessons, some interesting uh, resonances uh, for the future. Uh, this new country is created uh, out of a bit of uh, an empire. Uh, this new country does not exactly meet the interests of those people who were fighting for its independence. Uh, it's another classic international drawing of lines on a map. Uh, and having created this, uh, this new country of Albania, uh, the international community, the great powers of Europe, uh, are looking for a way to, uh, to govern it and to develop its institutions. 
as they will continue to do throughout the century uh, in different places. Uh, and so uh, they set up this country as a monarchy, uh, and they look around uh, and they find a king for Albania. Um, and the king they find is a very tall uh, German prince, a minor German prince called Prince Vil Wilhelm of Wied. <coughs> Uh, and uh, the new King Wilhelm of Albania uh, arrives in Albania uh, and is sort of presented to his people as their new king, and there's a sort of small welcoming party, and they <coughs> politely welcome him, uh, and he sets up in, in great style um, in, in, uh, in Albania and begins to rule his new kingdom. And it lasts for about six months uh, before it all kind of collapses in chaos. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the great powers who are the sponsors of this arrangement, are increasingly distracted by their own uh, divisions. Um, uh, Italy and Austria-Hungary each have their own very clear uh, and rival interests in Albania. Uh, on the ground, uh, there, is, uh, there are kind of conflicting popular movements, uh, all of which means that from the start, uh, Wilhelm rules over very little, uh, and is faced with a growing instability in the country uh, which, uh, for which he has utterly inadequate uh, military support. Um, the little um, as a kind of international gendarmerie is, is completely uh, inadequate to deal with that. Um, the international uh, rivalries that are behind the scenes uh, make the situation worse, not better. Uh, and in the end, the whole of Europe is collapsing into the First World War anyway. Um, and after six months, uh, the six-month kingdom uh, collapses uh, in the face of a, a kind of popular uprising, uh, and uh, Wilhelm uh, escapes by boat. Um, if you ever want to read this kind of historical romance, there's a book called, I think, called Six-Month Kingdom by a, uh, I think it was actually Irish, kind of gentleman, adventurer, soldier, who had got bored with soldiering uh, and then wrote to this Prince Wilhelm when he heard he'd been made king and said, hello, I'm a sort of gentleman officer, um, I wonder if you'd be interested in any help. And so he was taken on as his secretary uh, and went out to Albania and he tells the story of the six-month kingdom and it's a, a bizarre romance with, as I say, uh, resonances for uh, the next hundred years of interventions in the Balkans. Uh, so that was the, it's the, the hundredth uh, anniversary of uh, Albania and uh, the start of what becomes the first international intervention in Albania. It's other anniversaries too. 70 years ago, <coughs> 1942, the, uh, the new round, a new round of international interventions in Albania was starting to, to increase. Uh, and at the same time in Yugoslavia as well. The context for this, of course, the Second World War. Uh, Italy and Germany have, have carved up uh, the uh, carved up Southeastern Europe between them. And uh, the idea is forged, particularly in Britain, that wouldn't it be a good idea to uh, send in a few uh, British soldiers uh, to, to, to persuade uh, the locals in Albania and Yugoslavia to, uh, to rise up or to, to take the battle uh, to the Germans, and the Germans in particular, to an effort of the uh, And this would serve as a kind of distraction to uh, German activities in Europe. Uh, it would suck German soldiers into southeastern Europe uh, and distract them from uh, what was happening elsewhere in Europe. And so uh, a relatively small number of extremely brave uh, British soldiers uh, working under the auspices of the Special Operations Executive parachute into uh, Yugoslavia uh, and into Albania and they make contact with um, those people they've heard of who are starting to form some kinds, and I stress the plural, of um, movements, local movements. And that's a very generalised phrase because as becomes clear it's quite difficult to unify what it is these groups actually want. In both Yugoslavia uh, and Albania, there are uh, groups who are uh, interested in restoring uh, the, the old system. Uh, in Yugoslavia, these are predominantly uh, Chetniks. Uh, there are all sorts of names, nationalists, um, 
<coughs> zoologists uh, and various other names in Albania for these groups who are kind of trying to restore the status quo or would like the status quo back again. At the same time, in both Yugoslavia and Albania, there are um, kind of proto-communist um, movements of national liberation with an explicitly socialist or communistic uh, style under Tito in Yugoslavia and Hodja uh, in Albania. Uh, very little is known of all of this uh, at the time. When these guys uh, drop out of the sky um, with um, sort of limited small arms and a few pockets full of gold and a radio, um, they don't really know who they're going to get in touch with. Um, what happens, and I'll focus particularly on Albania, uh, is that they, they start to make contact both with uh, nationalist uh, groups in the north of Albania and with um, the, uh, the Hodja-led groups in the south and start to try to uh, persuade them to fight against uh, Germans. Uh, and they uh, offer money for this, um, they offer the promise of future military support from, uh, from the British and, and, and the other allies. Um, and they also argue that it's, it's generally a good thing uh, to, uh, to, to, to fight against the Germans because the Germans are a bad thing, therefore uh, all of us good chaps should fight against them. Uh, it doesn't really achieve very much, particularly in Albania. Uh, the, uh, the groups uh, in Albania, it turns out, are much more interested in fighting each other. Uh, the the so-called nationalist groups uh, tend to be very parochial, concerned with protecting their own way of life, um, essentially in their own village, possibly uh, more widely. Um, they have no particular focus against uh, Germans or anyone else. Uh, and the Hodja, meanwhile, uh, is trying to uh, conduct a revolution, uh, change the whole basis of society uh, in Albania, uh, and he has no particular interest in, in fighting um, one of the great colon in helping one of the great colonial empires to run its war uh, against another great colonial empire. Uh, they are much more concerned with uh, extending their own influence, protecting their own influence, and securing uh, their own uh, interests. Uh, these interests do not substantially overlap with the interests uh, of the British government. Uh, these various brave men um, uh, have a really fairly rough time um, in the highlands uh, of Albania, uh, chased by the Germans, constantly trying to um, negotiate and broker uh, a local peace in order to focus uh, effort against the Germans. Um, just occasionally they manage to conduct an attack on the German convoy or um, blow up a bridge or something, but it doesn't really uh, change the dynamic very much. It doesn't uh, substantially alter uh, the, the German situation in, in Albania, um, it doesn't substantially alter the, the balance of power in Albania between these different rival Albanian groups. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, as uh, German forces weaken and kind of contract back towards Germany, uh, Hodja takes advantage of that. Uh, the partisan movement, his, his national, labor, national liberation movement, uh, expands out, um, dominates Albania, and becomes uh, the post-war authority. Much the same happens um, for Tito in Yugoslavia. Uh, and you're left with a Yugoslavia led by uh, Tito and Albania led by, uh, by Hodja. <coughs> the, the British interest in that intervention was about its own struggle in Europe. Its policy was to try to avoid picking sides because it thought that would not be prudent or helpful, try to be very balanced and reasonable, get everyone to fight together against the nasty Germans, and also to avoid prejudging the final shape of Albania. One of the problems with the, the drawing up of the state of Albania was that it did not include all Albanians. If we look at a map of um, Albanians, today, the ethnic group, uh, they straddle um, Montenegro, bits of Serbia, um, Macedonia, Greece, uh, Kosovo, and Albania itself. Albania is only a, a small bit of that, a chunk of that. Um, because uh, the British did not want to prejudice their relations with Yugoslavia, with Greece, Italy, 
uh, you know, in any kind of post-war environment. The British were very careful not to prejudge um, the final shape of, of, of what came out of the war. That was good diplomatic stuff. The problem was that the um, avoiding picking sides made, in the end, the British intervention rather irrelevant. Um, and not prejudging the final shape of Albania made the British less popular with the Albanians. Uh, and one of the uh, kind of strange paradoxes, which it's hard for us to kind of even believe now, uh, is that actually for the Albanians, the German occupation uh, in the Second World War wasn't too bad, because the Germans were the only people who ever offered um, an, an ethnically based Albanian territory. And that was one of the many reasons why it was sometimes difficult for these British officers to try to convince uh, the, the Albanians to, to fight against the Germans. Sixty years ago, 1952, there was another, uh, another bizarre intervention going on uh, when uh, initially the British, but then the British and the Americans in partnership came up with the idea that it would be a good plan to try to roll back some of the communism that was spreading around the world um, by toppling Enver Hoxha. And the way to do this would be to take some uh, Albanian exiles, uh, perhaps those who'd fled during the war, as it were, started the war as a result of uh, Hodges coming to power, train them up in a bit of sort of sabotage and, and sedition, and then uh, sail them across the Adriatic and have them land, um, go back to their old villages or to local villages, uh, and with a bit of money and a bit of persuasion, um, persuade uh, the local people to rise up and, uh, and spread a kind of a national rising again to overthrow Hodja. Uh, it was a fiasco. Uh, the, uh, the training was hopeless or inadequate. Um, the, the whole basis of the operation was essentially patronising, uh, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the Albanians were referred to as pixies by uh, the British and American uh, controllers simply because they were short, which kind of sets the, the tone of the whole thing. Uh, normally within hours of landing uh, on these deserted beaches, uh, these people were being uh, picked up by Hodges security police um, and it achieved absolutely nothing except uh, convincing or confirming him in his paranoia uh, that the Western world was against him and trying to, trying to undermine him. It's the 20th anniversary of uh, the, the expansion of the, the war in Yugoslavia uh, into Bosnia. Um, I'm sure you've done Bosnia to death if you've been studying uh, interventions, um, but uh, by 1992 uh, the war has spread out of Slovenia and Croatia into Bosnia uh, and the international community is now starting to consider much more seriously how uh, to intervene to stop what is becoming uh, a very, very unpleasant war uh, on Europe's doorstep. Uh, at, the, at that time, it's an attempt to, um, to pacify and to stabilise this very volatile situation um, while allowing diplomacy to work to try to find some way to, to uh, limit uh, the, the growing chaos in southeastern Europe. Uh, I'm not going to, this evening, go into the strengths and weaknesses of how the international community did its business from <coughs> 1991 to 1995. Um, there are books written by people like Douglas Hurd, um, uh, David Owen, about <coughs> the, the merits of their cautious diplomatic approach. Um, Brendan Sims has written Unfinest Hour, which tells you why that approach was a disaster. You can read those and, uh, and, and balance them out. Uh, in the end, though, what we did in, in Bosnia was essentially we picked sides. Uh, having tried uh, to to do the kind of pacification, uh, even-handedness thing, um, <coughs> we found that wasn't working. Um, we found that um, the atrocities were continuing uh, basically unstopped. It became clear that if we had wanted seriously to pacify the situation, actually to impose a peace, to hold the line, while uh, addressing the underlying tensions diplomatically, it would have taken a, an even more substantial military force with a more robust doctrine and a lot more time uh, than was available. In the end, um, the international community basically picked sides and found some external diplomatic levers um, to freeze the situation 
and carve out a new kind of holding reality, a new diplomatic arrangement. Twenty years on, that is still the arrangement. Um, Twenty years on, arguably, it has not made a great deal of progress. Uh, there, are st there are still um, fundamental challenges to the coherence of Bosnia as a state, uh, which was the, the model that the international community tried to uphold. Uh, and some people might suggest that it's actually getting worse, um, that the, 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 the model of a Bosnian state is now more challenged <coughs> by the entities in Bosnia uh, than it has been for, for a number of years. Ten years ago, as we mark through anniversaries, uh, there's no particular date ten years ago, but by ten years ago, the intervention in Kosovo uh, was uh, well underway. We were three years into the, uh, the, the state building there. Kosovo was a, a product of all that had gone before it. Um, the, uh, the concepts, the ideas that motivated the intervention an explicitly humanitarian intervention in Kosovo in 99, I think were clear products of what had happened uh, in the 1990s before. Um, Srebrenica, um, Rwanda uh, had shown the world that horrible things were possible uh, even at this end of the century. Uh, and had stirred up this sense that these things, that we had to find a new and more um, dynamic way to intervene to stop these. And there were particular people who felt this. Uh, the people who intervened in Kosovo in 1999, uh, particularly on the American side, were precisely the same people, um, Wilkinson himself, Martin Albright, Richard Holbrook, uh, Wesley Clark, um, who uh, had gone through Bosnia, uh, and who felt the failure of, of, of Srebrenica. Um, I listened to Bill Clinton uh, talk once, uh, three or four years ago. Uh, he still feels, he still talks about the failure, his failure, the, the international community's failure uh, in Rwanda. Uh, and I think that, uh, that sense was one of the motives behind, one of the clear motives behind Kosovo in 99. It's the product of that feeling. So the world storms in in 99 and kind of creates Kosovo. It, it, it grabs Kosovo out of the clutches of, of Milosevic. Um, and that's um, uh, a very exciting moment for President Clinton and Prime Minister Blair. Uh, Prime Minister Blair walks through the refugee camps and is hailed as the liberator. Uh, and it's a very inspiring, positive story for humanitarian intervention. And we suddenly find ourselves and in particular, the UN finds itself with the country to run. And there hadn't been a lot of thought on that bit. There was, a, there was a lot of thought to the kind of, how do you punish Serbia? How do you stop the humanitarian crisis? Uh, how do you finally teach Milosevic a lesson? And eventually that was kind of worked out, and eventually there was a credible ground force, uh, and so eventually the Serb um, militaries and paramilitaries were pushed out of Kosovo, um, and uh, a NATO ground force goes in. <laughs> and then what? And that was the challenge that faced the UN, uh, and the UN created a mission in Kosovo um, to go in and to uh, establish, to, to provide uh, sensible governance uh, in Kosovo um, until such time and moving towards the resolution of the final status of Kosovo. There was no clear process for that. There was no clear timeline for that. But the idea was that the UN would go in and kind of hold the ground and fill the vacuum of administration um, while eventually someone got round to working out what was actually going to happen with Kosovo. Um, what became clear, though, was that there were... Once, it was, once we'd shifted away from the, the humanitarian bit, there were wildly different views about what should happen in Kosovo. Uh, and so the UN tended to kind of go down to the lowest common denominator uh, of doing the kind of what was necessary to offend no one. Uh, it held the ground. Uh, it helped to establish uh, local institutions to provide uh, essential uh, administration. Um, but there was no uh, clear push to resolve the question of Kosovo status. <coughs> 
And so we get into this rather sort of peculiar um, uh, state building by default. Uh, the UN is avowedly neutral, but um, of necessity it is helping to establish the institutions um, of what is de facto an independent state, simply because it has to to keep the place running. Uh, and eventually you get to something called the Provisional Institutions of Self-Government, which is pretty much the government of an independent state, but we're not allowed to call it that by 2006, um, because that will upset people who are still not comfortable with the idea of an independent Kosovo. As a, an act of stabilisation, this was very successful. Um, after an initial period of kind of vengeance and, and property theft, uh, in the summer of 99, the situation broadly stabilises, and Kosovo just kind of stumbles on. By 2004, though, the frustration with the lack of uh, progress, the frustration with the lack of clarity on what's actually happening uh, with this place, has uh, reached a kind of you know, boiling point, if you like. Um, it has been the international diplomats, I suspect, thought they were terribly clever in keeping the lid on things and not coming up with a clear and final answer, because clear and final answers always upset someone, so much better just to kind of not get to that point and just keep it under control. Um, terribly clever, but deeply frustrating for uh, those people who thought that in 1999 they had won their independence and their liberty. And in more practical terms, uh, I believe that this factor of uncertainty was actually prolonging and making worse the inter-ethnic tensions. Uh, because rather than having a kind of uh, short, sharp shock, um, Kosovo has changed new system, independence, new government, um, the international community kept open Kosovo's status and therefore allowed everyone involved Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo uh, and the government in Belgrade to believe that this was still all to play for. So no one at any level could feel comfortable. Um, if you were a, uh, a farmer uh, in Kosovo of one ethnicity or another, you still couldn't be sure that the land you owned might not be claimed by someone else next year because the international community had not clarified it yet. Uh, if you were in Belgrade, you still have the strong impression that Kosovo was there to play for. And this, I think this uncertainty, um, the fact that this was unresolved, I think fuels the sense of volatility, uh, which in 2004 um, boiled over into a, a, a short period of writing, three days of writing in, in March, uh, in which 19 people were killed. Uh, that kind of reminds the world that Kosovo is unfinished business. Um, they, because it hadn't blown up any time recently, people had kind of quietly forgotten about the Balkans. Uh, after 9-11, uh, um, the, the Balkans seems like a rather sort of old-fashioned, almost kind of colonial era intervention. Um, there's a much kind of new and rawer kind of world we're now focused on. 2004 uh, refocuses people's minds on the Balkans, reminds them that uh, there's unfinished business there, um, and this uh, leads to um, what we can celebrate the fifth anniversary of this year, as we move forward on the clock, the uh, Comprehensive Settlement Proposal, <coughs> drawn up by uh, former Finnish President Marti Atasari and proposing a, a kind of an artful balance. Kosovo will be an independent country, it says, but with uh, a package of decentralisation and special protection for minorities that can reassure everyone who cares about it that um, uh, there will be no uh, continuation of uh, inter-ethnic tension uh, and, and hostility. There's a lot of diplomatic dancing around that. It's never formally accepted by the UN under whose auspices it was created. Uh, but in 2008, uh, we celebrate the fourth anniversary about six days ago. Uh, 2008, Kosovo declares independence in agreement with a number of its international uh, friends on the basis of the Atosari plan. Uh, and so on the basis of that, uh, Kosovo becomes an independent state. 
<coughs> and something called the International Civilian Office is set up um, to um, monitor and to guide Kosovo as it finally establishes all of the institutions of a functioning independent state. Uh, and uh, the International Civilian Office leads ahead of policy, and that's uh, when I went back to Kosovo. Uh, we can talk more, I'm happy to answer questions about what the ICO has achieved um, and the international community more widely in Kosovo. Um, I think there are two, we can talk also about the remaining fundamental challenges in Kosovo, about ethnicity, about economy and so on. I focus on just two key issues for the time being before I try to wrap this up. There are two, I think, outstanding issues. Firstly, there is still a residual debate about Kosovo status. This is not done. To me, all of those factors of uncertainty and frustration that were there in 2004 <coughs> have not gone away because the international community has still not finally decided this. The European Union is still divided on the status of Kosovo. Only 22 of the EU member states have recognised Kosovo. Um, Belgrade still has the strong feeling that Kosovo is to play for. So no one is ready to kind of let bygones be bygones, concede anything, um, no one is ready to admit past faults because they think this will influence um, some final arbitration of status. And the second challenge is for the EU, I believe. Um, one of the main carrots that's been held out to Kosovo uh, is eventual EU membership. This is the same carrot that's been held out to uh, a number of other states, to all of the states in southeastern Europe. Uh, basic deal, be good children, it's the patronising approach to it, um, do what you're told, set up good uh, institutions, um, establish uh, a European-based model of law, uh, conform to our kind of trade arrangements, um, and don't kill each other, and eventually, eventually you'll get EU membership. That has been, in general, an extremely positive force in southeastern Europe. The lure of EU membership and the patient work, the technical work of the European Commission to establish um, structures and, and, and develop policies in southeastern Europe has been a huge force for um, stabilisation and the development of those countries. But we find ourselves today with that carrot, I think, kind of starting to shrivel a bit. And it's becoming clear to a lot of these states in southeastern Europe that the, the promised uh, EU membership may not be as close as they were originally led to believe. I can remember conversations um, several years ago now in the Foreign Office where there was a debate about wouldn't it be appropriate if all of the states the former Yugoslavia were to join the EU in 2014 on the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War, Sarajevo, poetic historical resonance, wouldn't it be wonderful? The idea of these countries joining uh, the EU in 2014 now is absolutely hilarious, inconceivable, not going to happen with the exception of, of, of Croatia. There's just a couple of um, themes, I'd like to drive this, and I apologise if I'm going to go just a couple of minutes more um, on this, Elisa. Um, two, two things strike me in particular from um, the, the, the history of those interventions. Number one, um, know what you're doing uh, and agree on what you're doing. Uh, and this has been uh, the particular challenge of, um, of Kosovo over the last ten years. Uh, having a, a coherence of objective and the coherence of resources among all of those people uh, doing the intervening. Uh, we went into Kosovo as a humanitarian intervention. There hasn't been a humanitarian problem in Kosovo for about 11 years. There are people <coughs> with terrible, terrible living conditions, uh, particularly the Roma community, but also people in all communities, horrendous, horrendous conditions. But there isn't a kind of people killing each other, humanitarian crisis. And apart from that one blip, there has not been. Um, so what are we doing there? Um, we're now building a state. Um, but even though uh, very serious EU players like Germany are very you know, committed and active in building this state, they're still restrained in that activity by the five non-recognisers. Um, by getting involved 
as the EU, rather than as individual countries, the EU is now actually acting as a break on progress in Kosovo. <coughs> there are bits of the state building of Kosovo and bits of the state identity that are going much more slowly than they would because the EU is involved. And at a time when the, the benefits of being on the EU track are, are kind of seeming to <coughs> disappear at the distance a bit, that's problematic. Uh, again, we can talk separately about, for example, the European Rule of Law Mission, ULEX, as a, a paradigm of the problem um, that uh, the international community of the European Union has in Kosovo. The second thing that strikes me from these, uh, these examples is the strange phenomenon of parallel realities. <coughs> that we as interveners operate at one level of reality, intervening to fulfil a set of criteria that concern us. To, to address issues that concern us, while at another level, a completely different set of uh, realities pertains. This is most obvious uh, in the Second World War in Albania, where uh, these uh, very brave British soldiers parachute in uh, to persuade these people to, uh, to rise up and fight um, the, the horror that is Nazism. Uh, and clearly, uh, people on the ground in Albania have absolutely no interest whatsoever uh, in conducting uh, this struggle. Uh, because to do so will actually uh, damage their own interests, and they're fighting a completely different battle at the same time. Um, we, we, we've moved on from that a little bit. We see people as a little less uh, passive now, um, but it's hard to escape the kind of the memory of that, uh, the complete dissonance between the expectations of uh, the British soldiers that um, no one in their right mind would, would not want to fight Nazism with the fact that on the ground there were people for whom it was clearly in their interests not to bother because they were doing something else completely. I think we still see that uh, today in the Balkans. It's the fundamental challenge in Bosnia where uh, the international community has intervened and continues to intervene um, to establish um, a functioning, coherent state moving towards Europe. Um, while uh, a significant proportion of the politicians and people of Bosnia are, are working most actively against that uh, to protect uh, their own identities uh, at the, the entity level in Bosnia. Um, we go in with this kind of idea that we are helping countries along a mutually agreed path. Uh, there's a kind of rather patronising colonial idea when we intervene, that this is a country which, you know, it's, it's had some problems, um, but with a bit of international wisdom and a bit of international advice, um, even though it's currently a bit sort of further back on the development path, the path towards civilisation and European Union membership, with our help it will move along on that path. What we rarely imagine is that the people we are treating in this way aren't always interested in that path. They've got their own... Um, they're in fish to fry. And I think you can see that at the working level in Kosovo today as well, where, where politicians have uh, interests independent of what we are uh, trying to stimulate them with. We, uh, this, the, 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 the theme which kind of links those two points, is the question about what we really care about when we intervene. Uh, in Kosovo, I think, we have focused predominantly, and for good reason, on security and stability. Putting it very cynically, as long as people aren't killing each other, the Balkans is basically okay. It may not be improving at a fast rate, but if they're not killing each other, it's okay. Um, if you talk to the people of Kosovo, they don't have a security problem. They don't have a, the Albanians of Kosovo don't have a problem with Serbs. What they have a problem with is that their economy is in the toilet and going in the wrong direction, um, and that their government is, they see it, rampantly corrupt, uh, and that in 12 years of international uh, control of Kosovo, absolutely nothing has improved in education, healthcare, or energy. Um, we, we, we risk uh, seeming irrelevant by uh, operating at a different level to, uh, to the people of the country. In the 1940s, there was a context of World War II <coughs> and an orthodoxy that uh, all right-thinking people would want to resist Nazism. Today, there is a context of 
uh, the development of Europe and an orthodoxy that all right-thinking people would want to join the European Union. Um, I think that is um, increasingly uh, to play for. Uh, so when I am invited by the European Union to tell them why they're all wrong, uh, I will tell them about J.H. Fichte. J.H. Fichte was an extraordinary man, a poet, uh, a priest, a diplomat, uh, who was part of the Albanian delegation uh, for the treaty negotiations after the First World War, uh, trying to uh, advance the cause of Albanians as part of the kind of the European-wide peace settlement. Um, he, he knew, therefore, by experience, um, the, the deceits of the international community. Uh, because Albania's interests were not uh, addressed as they had hoped by the peace treaty. He looked back on a series of secret arrangements during the First World War by which Albania was going to be carved up again uh, and given off to different, uh, different powers afterwards, uh, an approach which you occasionally heard repeated in the Second World War. Anyway, George Fichte writes uh, a long uh, verse epic called The, the Highland Loot, uh, and uh, in that he refers to uh, the whore of the ages. And the whore of the ages that he was referring to is Europe. And he's referring to how Europe uh, will allow uh, the Slavs, uh, will allow Russia um, to let her cubs, the Serbs, uh, carve up bits of Albanian lands. Uh, and Europe is duplicitous and, and, and cannot be trusted. Europe is the whore of the ages. And that's why uh, when today we're looking at northern Kosovo and when European diplomats are reassuring Kosovo that their interests, that Kosovo's interests will be protected, uh, but encouraging Kosovo to continue to, 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 to have dialogue and negotiation and everything will be all right in the end. Uh, in the back of Albanian minds, Kosovo Albanian minds, they can still hear Judge Fishter warning them that Europe is the whore of the ages. That's a ramble through hundreds of history. I'm really happy to take that in any direction at all, and I'd love to get, you know, from all the discussions you've been having and your experiences, your own thoughts. Thank you.